Hello everyone. Today we're starting a section called Gravitational Potential Energy. In this section we'll be learning about how to measure the acceleration due to gravity, as well as the idea of potential energy, and things like chemical potential energy, elastic potential energy, and especially gravitational potential energy. So to start with, we're going to be talking about how we can measure the acceleration due to gravity. It turns out one of the easiest ways to do this is with a pendulum. You can see a huge pendulum over here. So as it turns out, pendulums can be used very simply to measure the gravitational acceleration. The period of a pendulum is what we call the time it takes for the pendulum to swing back and forth. Not just from one end to the other end of its uh, swing, but to go all the way there and all the way back. That's one period. The length of the period in seconds is given by this equation here. The period is equal to 2 pi times the square root of L over G. Now L uh, doesn't quite seem so obvious, but G is of course the gravitational acceleration. So that's how we can uh, figure out the gravitational acceleration with this equation. It turns out the L is the length of the string in the pendulum. So if we rearrange the equation, as we can see in this series of equations here, then we'll end up with the gravitational acceleration equals 4 pi squared times the length of the pendulum over the period squared. So that means that just by measuring the period and the length of the pendulum, we're able to determine the gravitational acceleration. Now you might notice that there's no m in there. That's because the mass of the pendulum doesn't matter. The acceleration due to gravity will be the same for all pendulums. That means that no matter uh, how heavy a pendulum is, as long as it's the same length, it'll have the same period as any other pendulum with the same length, assuming that we have the same acceleration, of course. It turns out that this isn't always true. If we have the pendulum swinging through a very large angle, then we need an adjustment to our equation, and it becomes a lot more long and complicated. So this means that if we want to use our equation to calculate the gravitational acceleration, then we're going to need to use only small angles in order to swing the pendulum back and forth. We can't use, say, 45 degrees or 90 degrees. So what can we use instead? Well, just small angles between about 5 degrees and 10 degrees. If it's larger than that, then we'll get uh, inaccuracies that get larger and larger as the angle increases. So it turns out that if we want to get a really accurate measurement, we shouldn't just take one. We should take several and get an average. But by measuring the time it takes for 10 periods, we can effectively make uh, 10 different measurements with only a single count. The advantage of having uh, measuring 10 periods and then dividing by 10 means that any error due to, say, stopping the stopwatch wrong or mismeasuring the length of the pendulum will be reduced by a factor of 10. This means that we can get a more accurate answer. So let's try this experiment, shall we? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now that we have the period of 10 periods, or the time that it takes for the pendulum to oscillate through 10 periods, we can divide this number by 10 in order to find uh, just the, uh, a single period of the pendulum. And from this, we can calculate gravitational acceleration. So now that we have our results from our experiment, we can actually use them to figure out what the gravitational acceleration is. The first thing we ought to do is figure out the length of one period. We know that 10 periods take 9.25 seconds. And so that means that one period uh, is simply that number divided by 10. So a single period is 0 0.925 seconds. Now we can use this old equation in order to figure out exactly what the gravitational acceleration is we can substitute in the length of the pendulum being 21 centimeters and the period being 0 0.925 uh, seconds to end up with an equation looking something like this. 
Then we can use a calculator to evaluate that and find that the acceleration due to gravity is about 9.69 meters per second squared. Now, this is pretty close to what we expected, right? 9.81 meters per second squared, but it's not exactly the same. So an important part of experimental physics is trying to figure out what sorts of errors could mess up your results. It's easy enough to say that, you know, you measured the length of the string wrong or you timed it wrong. But remember, because we took an average, we actually timed it fairly accurately. And while the length of the string may have been a few millimeters off, it won't really make too much of a difference to our answer here. So what are the other sources of error? It could have been that the motion of the pivot would affect the period. Remember that if I'm holding the pivot, then it's not perfectly straight. Even if it was attached to a retort stand, various vibrations and such on the table could change the pivot to change slightly. And that means that the period of the pendulum would change a little. Uh, another problem might be that the angle could be too large. Remember that for very large angles, the period gets increasingly larger and doesn't quite follow the equation that we're using. If the angle that I used to swing the pendulum was too large, then that would affect the period and thus our estimation for the gravitational acceleration. Another option is that the string is not massless. For an ideal pendulum, the string weighs nothing and therefore has no effect on exactly the acceleration of the mass on the end. In real life, the string is not massless. This means that rather than having just a simple mass on the end of a string with no mass, we actually have a pendulum that's got quite a long length and that will affect the period because it will move differently to a ideal pendulum. Finally, the local acceleration due to gravity might not be exactly 9.81 meters per second squared. You know, it might be 9.80. And so that would explain why the results that we got aren't quite as close to the expected value. That said, they're so far away that it's likely that the cause of error was due to one of these earlier options rather than the last one. All right, so that's the end of uh, this section. I hope you enjoyed the experiment that we did. So in this section, we've learned about how to calculate gravitational acceleration from a pendulum. And we've actually done a prac to see exactly what that looks like. So let's go on to some questions. Question one, how would the period of a pendulum change on a planet that had the same radius as Earth, but was twice as heavy? Now to get the answer to this, all we need to find out is how the gravitational acceleration on the planet will change, right? So remember that the gravitational force, and therefore the gravitational acceleration, will be proportional to the mass of the body, right? That means that if we have the same radius as Earth, but we're twice as heavy, the gravitational acceleration is exactly twice as much. So how does that affect the period of a pendulum? Well, what's the equation for the period again? There we go, period equals 2 pi times the square root of L over G. That means that if we double g, then the period is going to increase, uh, sorry, decrease by a factor of root 2. When g becomes larger, it's on the denominator, so the entire uh, equation will become smaller. Question 2. Suppose a pendulum is swung at the top of a tall mountain near the Earth's equator. Its period will be either longer, equal, or shorter than its period at the South Pole, or much shorter than at the South Pole. So the question here is how does the gravitational acceleration change based on the fact that you're at the equator at the top of a mountain? Remember that the gravitational acceleration is inversely proportional to the radius uh, of the planet, and that if the radius changes, such as if you're at the equator, then that will change the gravitational acceleration. So let's go through our options. If it were equal to the period at the South Pole, that means that the gravitational acceleration at the South Pole and at the equator would be exactly identical. This is not the case. There is a very slight difference. If it were much shorter than the South Pole, then that would imply that there was a big difference. This is in fact not the case. 
And even in space, uh, at the altitude of the space shuttle, for example, gravitational acceleration is comparable to what it is on Earth. Uh, if it were a little bit shorter than the South Pole, that means that the gravitational field would be a little bit stronger. But we know that because we're at the equator on a high mountain, we're at a larger radius than at the South Pole. And this means that the gravitational acceleration is smaller. So our last option is A, a little bit longer than at the South Pole. And A is, in fact, the correct answer. We can see that when the strength of the gravitational field decreases, the period of the pendulum will increase. If you want to be completely sure of that, you can check the equation for the pendulum's period. Question 3. The moon has a gravitational acceleration of 1.62 meters per second squared. Calculate the period of a pendulum with a length of 20 centimeters and a mass of 80 grams. So what is that 80 grams there for? Nothing yet. The mass of the pendulum does not affect its period in any way. If we wanted to calculate the weight of the pendulum, then we would take this mass and multiply it by uh, the gravitational acceleration. But in fact, we're not trying to find the force on the, on the pendulum, we're trying to find its period. And that's given by this equation here. As you can see, it does not depend on mass. Substituting in 20 centimeters and 1.62 meters per second squared, we end up with this. Remember that 20 centimeters is not an SI unit, and it needs to be converted into meters before you can use it in equations. Evaluating that gives us 2.21 seconds. If you compare this to the period of our pendulum that we tested, uh, we had something more like a little less than one second. So obviously on the moon, we have a significant change in the length of a pendulum, or the period of a pendulum, rather. Question four. Explain why a set of scales that produces a measurement of mass in kilograms will show different numbers for an astronaut's mass when it is taken to different planets. I thought that we learned that mass stayed the same no matter what planet you're on, right? So it turns out that scales don't actually measure mass directly. The mass of the astronaut does not change. This is always going to be true, right? Unless they somehow, you know, lose weight while in space. Uh, the set of scales measures weight and is calibrated to express the weight in kilograms. It does this by taking the amount of weight in newtons and dividing it by 9.81 meters per second squared, which will give it a result in kilograms. And that's the reading that it produces. It means that 9.81 newtons will produce a reading of one kilogram, right? So that means if we take it to a different planet where the gravitational acceleration is not 9.81 meters per second squared, then it'll get a different number of newtons, but it will still be using this conversion factor. And so it will give you the wrong mass. Remember, the mass doesn't change, the weight does. Finally, question five. A pendulum in the space shuttle will not swing back and forth. It will just sort of float. Explain why. Is it because there's no gravity in space? No. The effect is not caused by a lack of gravity. The gravitational field of the Earth produces a force on objects in the space shuttle. This force is in fact stronger than the gravitational force of the Moon when you're standing on the surface of the Moon. So why doesn't it swing back and forth? Well, the answer is because the pivot of the pendulum is not fixed. The pivot of the pendulum is moving uh, with the spacecraft, which is sort of falling at the same rate as the pendulum. If they're all accelerating at the same rate, it means that there's no fixed point for a pendulum to swing back and forth from, and everything just sort of floats around and experiences a sensation of weightlessness. And so this is the reason that we don't get any movement from the pendulum in the way that we might expect if the pivot was fixed. Well, that about does it for the questions. So in this section, we've uh, learned about
gravitational acceleration and exactly how to measure it. And remember that we can do that simply by timing a pendulum and then using an equation to relate the period of a pendulum and the length of the pendulum to the gravitational acceleration. Thank you.